Thus have I heard two and a half thousand years ago in northern India, there lived a young man of the Gotama clan. We don't actually know his first name. He was later called Siddhartha Gotama, but that's clearly a later designation since Siddhartha means the accomplished one and most newborn kids aren't that accomplished. And it doesn't show up in the, in the literature until several hundred years after his death. But we can call him Siddhartha Gotama since we don't have another name for him. When he was 29 years old, Siddhartha Gotama left his home and headed south and east to the land of the Kalamas to seek his spiritual fortune. India at that time was crawling with spiritual seekers. It was an interesting time in that the agricultural skills had advanced to such a point that they actually were producing a surplus of food. Not everybody had to be involved in agriculture. And so this surplus could be used to feed spiritual seekers. It also could be used to feed standing armies. You win some, you lose some. Siddhartha Gautama found a teacher named Alara Kalama, and he studied with this teacher. He learned his doctrine and also his meditation practice, which culminated in what we call the seventh jhana, the realm of no-thingness. He was quite skilled at this, and eventually his teacher said to him, you know my teachings as well as I do. You are as skilled in the practice as well as I am. Come, let us lead this group together. But Siddhartha Gautama had left home looking for a solution to, well, old age, sickness, and death. And all he found was seven jhanas. So he left. He continued on east and south Ganges River Valley, and eventually found another teacher, Udaka Ramaputta, Udaka, the son of Rama. And he learned Rama's doctrine and Rama's meditation practice. And again, he excelled at both of them, such that Udaka Ramaputta said, you know Rama's teachings and practice as well as Rama. You should lead this Sangha. But Siddhartha Gautama had only found the eighth jhana. He still didn't have a solution for old age, sickness, and death. So he left once again. Then he began practicing austerities. One of the austerity practices was the breathless meditation. In that he would hold his breath for as long as he could. Over and over and over again. Just not breathing. And what he discovered was that if you spend a lot of time holding your breath for extremely long periods of time, it gives you terrible headaches, but nothing more than that. So then he switched to the practice of eating <clears throat> one grain of rice a day. First, just less and less food until it was one grain of rice a day. And what he learned from eating one grain of rice a day was that you get really weak. You have a tendency to fall over, but you don't learn anything about what to do about old age, sickness, and death. So at some point, six years after he left home, Siddhartha Gautama was like, you know, none of this is working. There's got to be another way. And he started thinking about what could possibly be another way. He remembered an incident from his childhood. He was sitting under a rose apple tree while his father was working. And he fell into the first jhana. And now some quarter century later, he remembers this incident. And in thinking about it, he says, you know, the pleasure associated with 
that experience was not sensual pleasure. It was a pure form of pleasure. Could these jhanas be the way to awakening? And the more he thought about it, the more he thought, yes, these jhanas could indeed be the way to awakening. But he also realized that in his emaciated state, he didn't have the energy to do jhana practice. So he began eating solid food. Now at that time, there were five other ascetics who were practicing with him. And when they saw he had resumed eating solid food, they thought he had given up the spiritual quest and they left in disgust. But Siddhartha Gautama hadn't given up the spiritual quest. He was just trying to find something that worked. He spent some time regaining his strength. We don't know how long it took, probably a few months. And then on the full moon in May, he sat down under a tree in what is now Bodhgaya with the determination that he was going to figure it out or sit there till the flesh rotted from his bones. He started out by stepping through the jhanas, one, two, three, four. And then with his mind concentrated, clear, sharp, bright, malleable, wieldy, and given to imperturbability, he spent the first watch of the night remembering past lives. And then with his mind still concentrated, clear, sharp, bright, malleable, wieldy, and given to imperturbability, he spent the second watch of the night seeing beings passing away and re-arising according to their karma. And then during the third watch of the night, he was able to gain such a deep understanding of what's actually happening, to be able to formulate it in what we know as the Four Noble Truths. And when the sun came up the next morning, he was a changed man. He was awake. He was the Buddha. He spent the next week just enjoying the bliss of awakening, sitting there under the tree. And then he began wondering, could he teach this to someone else? This could be useful to know what to do about old age, sickness, and death. He considered this Dhamma I have attained is profound, hard to see and hard to understand, peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning, subtle to be experienced by the wise. But this generation delights in attachment, takes delight in attachment, rejoices in attachment, it is hard for such a generation to see this important thing, namely this, that conditionality dependent origination, itapataya cha. And it's hard to see these important things, namely the stilling of all fabrications, the relinquishing of all acquisitions, the destruction of craving, Dispassion, cessation, Nibbana. He thought if he were to try and teach what he had learned and nobody got it, it would be wearying and troublesome. And his mind was disinclined to teach. It is said that one of the highest of the Brahma gods, Shahampati, realized the newly awakened was not inclined to teach. So then as quickly as a strong man could extend his arm or draw it back, he disappeared from the highest of the heavens and reappeared on earth before the Buddha. He got down on one knee, put his hands together in reverential salutation and begged the Buddha to teach for the benefit of gods and humans. He said, there are some who have little dust in their eyes. They will be able to understand what you have come to understand. And so the Buddha looked around with the eye of a Buddha 
and he could see many people with much dust in their eyes. And he could see some with modest amounts of dust in their eyes. And he could see a few with little dust in their eyes. And he thought maybe he could teach those who had little dust in their eyes. And then Shahampati, realizing he had managed to convince the Buddha to teach, as quickly as a strong man could extend his arm or draw it back, disappeared from the human realm and reappeared in the highest of the heavens. The Buddha thought, now, who should I teach? Who has little dust in their eyes? He remembered his first teacher, Alara Kalama. Surely he had little dust in his eyes, but unfortunately he had recently died. And then he thought of his second teacher, Udaka Ramaputta. Surely he too had little dust in his eyes, but he too had recently died. Then the Buddha thought about the five friends with whom he had been doing the ascetic practices. Perhaps they had dust, little dust in their eyes. Perhaps he should try and teach them. And so with the eye of a Buddha, he examined the world and he saw that they had traveled further west to the deer park at Isipitana, outside the village of Sarnath, near the great city of Varanasi. And so he set off in that direction. As he was walking that way, he encountered an Ajivaka. The Ajivakas were members of another religion. There were lots of religions at that time in India. And the Ajivaka was very struck by the Buddha's appearance. He said, your countenance is very pure. You do not seem like other men. Who is your teacher? The Buddha said, I have no teacher. I'm awake. And the Jivaka said, well, good for you, and passed by on the other side. The Buddha's first attempt at teaching didn't go over real big, but he persisted. He continued on until he came to Sarnath. to the deer park there. And as he approached, his friends saw him coming in the distance. Oh, look, it's Sid the slacker. Well, we'll let him sit with us, but we won't show him any reverence or anything. But when he drew near, one of them went and took his robe and bowl and another prepared a seat and another got water for him to wash his feet. And after he'd sat down and washed his feet, he said, well, guys, I figured it out. And they laughed. <laughs> they said, you didn't figure nothing out. We saw you. You were eaten. You gave up the holy life. He said, no, no. I was just looking for something that actually worked, and I found it. He said, but how could you have found anything? You resorted to a life of luxury. He said, no, 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 no. I was just looking for the middle way between sensual indulgence and austerities, and I found it. Look, have I ever said before that I had figured this out? Well, they had to admit he'd never claimed before. So they decided to listen to what he had to say. And he taught them the Dhamma Chakra Pavadna Sutta, the discourse setting in motion the wheel of Dhamma. That discourse talks about the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. Now, Four Noble Truths is the literal translation, but perhaps better would be the Four Ennobling Truths. Four things that if you deeply understand them will ennoble you, will make you a noble one, one who has had an awakening experience. The first of these Ennobling Truths is Dukkha Happens. They used to put that on bumper stickers. Well, they used a four-letter uh, Anglo-Saxon word instead of a poly word, but you know, same thing, dukkha happens. The word dukkha gets translated as suffering. Yeah, all suffering is dukkha, but dukkha is a much broader term. A better translation would be unsatisfactoriness. I've seen it as unpleasantness. My favorite translation is bummer. 
Dukkha is something that bums you out. A bummer in and of itself isn't the problem, it's your reaction. So like, uh, I went to the beach and I lost my sunglasses. Well, don't get all bummed out, man. It was only sunglasses. So if I go to the beach and I lose my sunglasses and my reaction is, well, I hope whoever finds them needs them more than I did, as opposed to getting all bummed out, then losing the sunglasses isn't a bummer. It's my reaction to something that makes it a bummer. And this is very important thing to understand about dukkha. The bummerness, the dukkhaness is not in the experience. It's in your reaction to the experience. And that gives you quite a lot of power because it, maybe you can not react in ways that produce suffering, unpleasantness, bummers. Modern science also talks about dukkha. I mean, they don't use the word dukkha or even bummer. They talk about entropy. Entropy is the tendency of things to go from a state of order to disorder. It's fairly easy to understand. Suppose you had a copy of War and Peace, a loose leaf copy in a notebook, right? And you open it up and you lift out all thousand pages. And now you throw the pages up in the air and they come fluttering down. And then you gather all the pages together and you make a nice looking pile. What are the odds that all the pages are in order, right side up and not front to back? I have a degree in math and, you know, that's a bigger order to try and figure out. I mean, the number is minuscule. Yeah. There's so many ways for it to go wrong and only one way for it to be right. When things change, it, as a usual rule, there are more ways for things to change to be more disorderly than for them to change in to be equally orderly or more orderly. And this tendency we refer to as entropy. We tend to find that when things become disorderly, we experience as a bummer. I mean, you know, you clean your house. It looks great. Three weeks later, somebody's come along and messed up your house. Who did that? It wasn't you, right? I mean, you're not making messes, but it happened. Or you get a new car. It's got the new car smell. 10 years later, uh, it's not a new car smell in there anymore. It's something else. Stale pizza or something. And it's got dents and scratches. And to keep the entropy away, how many oil changes have you had to do? And how many tune-ups? And how many spark plugs has it gone through? Unless, of course, you've got an electric car. Entropy. Even electric cars are subject to entropy. You might have noticed entropy happening in the mirror, right? It, it just happens to everything. And if you get bummed out about it, it's dukkha. Well, now the Buddha was really smart. He didn't try and figure out why is there dukkha? What's the cosmological source of dukkha? He went looking for a necessary condition for dukkha. You know, necessary condition? If you want the lights to be on, you turn on the light switch. If you want the lights to be off, you turn off the light switch. The light switch is a necessary condition for the lights to be on. It's not a sufficient condition. I mean, the power plant's got to be pumping out those electrons. The wires have to be intact. If the lights are on and you want to turn them off, there's a manipulatable necessary condition. And you just turn off that necessary condition and the lights go out. So what the Buddha did was set out to find a necessary condition for dukkha. Because if he could find one he could turn off, yeah, he'd turn off the dukkha. And he found it, craving. The Pali word is tanha. It literally means thirst, but it has the sense of unquenchable thirst. 
there's actually two words in Pali for thirst, but this is the one where you gotta have it. And craving is a good translation of it. He spoke of three types of craving. There's craving for sense pleasures, craving for becoming, and craving for not becoming. The craving for sense pleasures is pretty easy to understand. You want to see nice sights, you want to hear nice sounds, you want to taste nice food, smell nice smells, touch pleasant feeling textures, and have a pleasant mind state. And if you're craving that and you don't get it, bummer. Or if you're craving something like that and you get it and it goes away, bummer. So craving for sense pleasures can lead to dukkha. Now notice the craving doesn't cause the dukkha. Right? The Buddha wasn't looking for causes. He was looking for necessary conditions. This is an important thing to keep in mind. Often you do hear it said that craving causes dukkha, but that's not accurate. It's that dukkha arises dependent on craving. Another form of craving is craving for becoming. This can be this world becoming. You want to become rich and famous. You want to become well-liked. You want to, well, there's so many things you could possibly become. And then there's craving for becoming in the next world. You want to become in your next life, born into a family that has a Mercedes Benz. Or you want to be born as a deva or uh, all sorts of ideas for the next life. And these are bhava tanha, craving for becoming. The Brahmanism religion at the time of the Buddha was all about reincarnation. And you wanted a better life next time. So there was craving for your better life next time, better incarnation. And that craving, it's another setup for dukkha. And then there's vibhava tanha, craving for not becoming. Could be in this life, I'm craving not to become sick with COVID-19. I'm craving not to fall asleep during the talk because there might be something interesting. So there could be not becoming, and there could be not becoming in a future life. The Jains, which was another religion at the time of the Buddha, they were craving to not come back. They didn't want to become anything in the next life. And so they were trying to act in ways that wouldn't leave any karmic residue so that when they died, they wouldn't have to become again. And so they were had vibhava tanha. And if you had vibhava tanha and you did something slightly unskillful, oops, oh, that might lead to you becoming back and that would be dukkha. So all this craving doesn't cause the dukkha, but it's a setup for dukkha. You've turned on the light switch. I mean, the light switch doesn't make the light shine. The light's shining because of the electrons getting excited and pumping out photons. You don't even need to know that. You just need to know where the light switch is. And you want the lights to go off? You need to know where the light switch is so you can turn it off. Well, how do you turn off craving? Because the third ennobling truth is that with the cessation of craving is the cessation of dukkha. But how do you do that? I mean, if I tell you, don't crave anymore, are you still going to go out and crave? Human nature. I mean, if the Buddha himself were to sign into the Zoom room and tell you, don't crave, you'd still crave. You've got to learn to stop craving. And the method for learning to stop craving is the practices of the ennobling Eightfold Path. Eight practices that you're to undertake that when you master them will enable you to learn to stop craving. Stop craving, no more craving, no more dukkha. The first on the Eightfold Path is right view. Sama ditti. Sama is usually translated as right, but more appropriately, it could be translated as appropriate. And ditti is view, so appropriate view. 
And what is appropriate view? Well, it's interesting that this would be the first on the Eightfold Path. So the Buddha's teachings were preserved as an oral tradition for approximately 350 years after his death, with his followers reciting his sermons and the next generation learning those sermons so they could recite them and pass them on. And they were collected into five different collections. There was the long collection, and then there was the middle length collection, and then the thematic collection, and the numerical collection, and the, well, we could call it the miscellaneous collection, which basically contained everything that didn't fit into the other four collections. And in the miscellaneous con collection, the Kudaka Nikaya, there's a collection of suttas called the Sutta Nipata, 70 some suttas in the little sutta collection. Some of these are quite old and book four of the Sutta Nipata appears to contain material that was composed during the first three years of the Buddha's ministry. Most of the scholars agree that it's very early material and we don't have a picture of the Buddha there as having any followers or any monasteries. And we know from other sources that basically for the first three years, he was a solitary wanderer, gave discourses, but he didn't have people that were following him and no monasteries. And one of the essential overriding themes of book four of the Sutta Nipata, the Athagavaga, is not holding to fixed views. This makes good sense. I mean, if you're holding to a fixed view, you're not going to change your mind. And if you're not fully awakened right now and don't change your mind, well, you just guaranteed you're not going to become fully awakened. An open mind is absolutely essential on the spiritual path. Without an open mind, yeah, you're not going to make any progress. Now, this doesn't mean you shouldn't have views. But whatever view you're holding, you should hold it very lightly. It's a provisional view till something better comes along. And in fact, you're actually looking for better views, a better understanding of what's happening. So one aspect of right view is not clinging to views, keeping an open mind. Now, in other suttas, we find that right view is defined as the four ennobling truths. So we started out talking about the four ennobling truths, and we got to the fourth one, which is the ennobling eightfold path, and we get to the first one, which is right view, and sometimes it's defined as the four ennobling truths. The Buddha's teachings are holographic. If you dig down deeply enough into any of them, you find all of them. And so that's what's happening here. Now, in other suttas, we find right view defined as dependent origination, which we will talk about at great length in the latter part of this retreat. So is this a contradiction? Dependent origination, Four Noble Truths. Which one is it? Well, it turns out the Four Noble Truths are a summary of some of the key points of dependent origination. The way Ayakema said was the Four Noble Truths are dependent origination in telegram style. I guess today we have to say in Twitter style. Just hitting the high points. Right view is not a cosmological view of how the world came to be or anything like that, but really a statement of the problem, dukkha, and a dependency craving, and the thing to be done, let go of the craving, and the practices to take you there. This is very much like a, an Ayurvedic medical diagnosis. The problem, the thing it depends upon, the prognosis, and the medicine. The medicine is the practice of the Eightfold Path. So right view is basically looking at this, which is very limited 
It doesn't talk about how the world came to be or anything like that. It's just, yeah, there's a problem. Dukkha out here. Here's how you deal with it. The second on the Eightfold Path is right intention. And what is right intention? Intentions of renunciation, intentions of non-ill will, intentions of harmlessness. Renunciation, that's kind of a loaded term. Most people, when they hear renunciation, their reaction is something like, get your hands off my stuff. Well, the problem is we got so much stuff. We are inundated with stuff. I mean, you got so much stuff that when it's your birthday, somebody gives you some new stuff and what are you gonna do with it? I mean, your closets are full, all your artwork is hanging on the walls, you got no place to put it. Yeah, we got so much stuff that you can't get your car in your garage. You got so much stuff, you had to go down the street and rent another place to put all the extra stuff that you don't have room for at your place, but you don't want to let go of. Yeah, as lay people, we have to come to terms with our stuff. As lay people, we need more than three robes in a bowl, but we don't need the amount of stuff that our culture tells us that we need. Culture is all about get more stuff. You got a problem, buy this stuff on sale. It's all about acquiring stuff. That's not how the spiritual path works. As I mentioned last night, Ayakema said that the essence of the spiritual path is letting go. And that's what renunciation is about. It's about coming to terms with your stuff. In the Tibetan tradition, there's a book called Liberation in the Palm of Your Hand. Big old thick book. It was, it was interesting. I read it, but I really like the title because it's true. We do have liberation in the palm of our hand. You can see it. Make a fist. Come on, everybody make a fist. Hold it up in front of your face. All right. Now, you want to see liberation? Look at the palm of your hand. That's how you get there. So what you want to do is remember freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. See if you can shed some of the burden of your stuff. Ayakema said you should go through all of your closets every six months and anything you haven't worn in the last six months, give it to charity. You're not going to lose those pounds. It's not going to come back into style. Let it go. Unburden yourself. Come to terms with your stuff. George Carlin is probably not someone you want to learn right speech from, but he does have this absolutely brilliant routine on stuff. When the retreat's over, go to YouTube, plug in George Carlin stuff and watch his routine. It's brilliant. When he was alive, I had this fantasy of inviting him to come to one of my retreats. And when I got to this part of the Eightfold Path, just having him stand up and do his routine. It's one of the best Dharma talks on renunciation I've ever heard. So definitely check it out after the retreat. Okay. And then the other two, non-ill will and harmlessness, or if we were to state them positively, love and compassion. As I said, it turns out we're far more interconnected than is obvious on the surface. And we need to act in accordance with that interconnectedness. And acting with love and compassion is acting in harmony with the way things actually are. So these are, are the intentions that you want to have. Letting go, love and compassion. Think about it. Suppose everybody on this planet was acting from those places. Everyone had as their intention with every action, letting go, love and compassion. Think about how magnificent this place would be. It would be quite amazing. We wouldn't have the ton of problems we have right now. Well, the only way everybody's going to act like that is, well, it's, you're going to have to act like that too. You might as well start practicing. 
the Buddha did say it's right intention. When you intend to do something, check your motivation really carefully. What are you trying to do? What's going on here? When I first started teaching, I went up to every teacher that I admired and I said, help, help, give me advice. I'm starting to teach. And several people said, pay careful attention to your motivation which has been really helpful advice, not only for teaching, but for life in general. Is it loving? Is it compassionate? Is it letting go? These first two on the Eightfold Path are the wisdom aspect of the path. The next three are the sila aspect, the morality, ethics aspect. And the first of these is right speech. We talked a bit about right speech last night. It's one of the precepts. Don't lie, don't use harsh or abusive speech, don't use divisive speech, be a peacemaker, and don't engage in gossip or idle chatter. Now, you can use the truth as a weapon. This is not what the Buddha said. The Buddha said, if you know something that's not true and not useful, don't say it. If you know something that is true and not useful, don't say it. If you know something that's not true but is useful, don't say it. If you know something that's both true and useful, find the right time to say it and say it with a loving heart. Pay attention to what you're saying. It's, it's got to be true and useful and timely. And your attitude needs to be a loving attitude when you're saying it. We don't want to use harsh or abusive speech. It says in the suttas that one speaks with words that are pleasing to the ear of the many folk. We want to be peacemakers and not cause division. And we don't want to engage in the unedifying conversations of gossip and idle chatter. The Buddha listed a bunch of unedifying conversations Kings, ministers, armies, dangers, wars, food, clothing, drinks, beds, garlands, perfumes, villages, towns, cities, countries, carriages, relatives, heroes, women or men, street and well gossip, talk of the departed, desultory chat, speculations about land and sea, talk of being and non-being. Doesn't leave much to talk about. Now, admittedly, this list was given to the monks and nuns as lay people, as we discussed last night. Sometimes, yeah, you, you want to talk about, well, kings, ministers, armies, dangers, wars. That's the six o'clock Duca report, right? I mean, you, you do get a six o'clock Duca report. You have one of those dot boxes. I think they call it television. You know, you turn it on at six o'clock and they'll give you a Duca report. Food, clothing, shelter, uh, garlands, perfumes. Yeah. How many magazines can you find at a newsstand on that stuff? Towns, cities, countries, villages, Condé Nast Traveler, National Geographic. I mean, it's important to know what's going on in the world, but Pay attention to how much you're indulging in it. Carriages, that car and driver. Women, men, yeah, there's an exciting topic. Heroes. We live in a culture that's so weird that there are people who are famous just because they're famous. They haven't done anything noteworthy. They're just famous. We have this, I mean, People magazine. It's a weird culture. It's a very weird culture. Street and well gossip. I guess that's water cooler gossip. As I said last night, sometimes you do need to talk to people on some of these levels just to make a connection. Just know that's what you're doing when you're doing that. And if you find an opening to move the conversation to a higher level, by all means, take it. Next on the eightfold path is right action. And what is right action? To not kill to not steal, to not commit sexual misconduct. So we have four of the five precepts in two on the Eightfold Path. You might be wondering about the fifth precept on intoxicants. 
well, the Buddha is giving this talk to five guys living on a grain of rice a day. Uh, I don't think they were doing intoxicants. So he did actually come up with the fifth precept, uh, the precept on intoxicants, until he had lay followers. There were lots of other precepts that came along, but uh, the intoxicant one was in response to the lay followers. And then the third of the ethics ones is right livelihood. And what is right livelihood? Any livelihood that's not wrong livelihood. Okay, so what's wrong livelihood? Any livelihood that involves breaking one of the precepts or encouraging someone else to break one of the precepts. So if you don't drink alcohol, but you work in the liquor store, that would be considered wrong livelihood because you're encouraging other people to drink How do you make your living? How, how do you keep yourself alive on this planet? What are you doing? Are you making the world a better place or a worse place? That's basically the question. Sometimes it's rather obvious. There was a list of wrong livelihoods in, in the suttas. Being a slave trader, selling weapons, being a butcher, being a thief, being a gambler. You can probably come up with lots of wrong livelihoods. There's some livelihoods that are obviously right livelihoods, the helping professions. You're helping people out. Yeah, that's great. I used to work for a company that made a database. Database, that's, uh, that's like a software filing cabinet, right? Of course, who were our customers? California Water Resources Board, University of California, General Electric, Pentagon. Uh, yeah, was it right livelihood? I was glad when I got a different job. And then the last three on the Eightfold Path are usually called the Samadhi aspect. The mind training aspect would be more appropriate, I guess. And the first of these is right effort. What is right effort? Well, there's two broad categories for what right effort. One of them we've already talked about, the attitude of relaxed diligence not being too slack, missing out on the diligence, and not trying too hard, missing out on the relaxed. There's the story of Sona, who was so delicately raised, he had hair growing on the soles of his feet. And so he became a monk, and he's doing walking meditation. His feet are cracked and bleeding, and he's like, I can't do this, I'm going to go home. He goes to see the Buddha to say, yeah, I'm just roving, I'm going home. And the Buddha says, uh, Sona, can you play a lute? Yes, venerable sir, I can play a lute. When you tune your lute, do you tune the strings as tight as they will go? Well, no, venerable sir. Well, do you loose them up till they're really slack? No, venerable sir. Well, what do you do? Well, in the middle, find the right place in the middle. Same thing with your effort, Sona. Find the middle way with your effort. And of course, as always happens in these stories, Sona went back, not striving so hard, still being diligent, and eventually became an arhat. So my phrase, relaxed diligence, is to try and get you to find that not striving too hard, but not being lazy. The other way that right effort is explained is the four great efforts to make an arisen, unwholesome state go away. To prevent the arising of an unarisen, unwholesome state. To make an unarisen, wholesome state arise. And to take an arisen, wholesome state and keep it around and bring it to perfection. I'll give you an example. You're driving on the freeway. And some idiot cut you off. And the next thing you know, you're screaming four letter words at your windshield. An unwholesome state of mind has arisen. Anger. Okay, so this is aversion. What's the antidote to aversion? Metta practice. So you start doing metta. May you learn to drive. May you arrive safely at your destination. All right, so you know, Get your mind out of screaming four-letter words at the windshield. 
So you continue down the freeway and some other idiot cuts you off and you're just about to start screaming four letter words of your windshield, but you stop it. May you learn to drive. May you arrive safely at your destination. So you prevented the arising of an unwholesome state, but you also made a wholesome state arise. We'll keep it around and bring it to perfection. May we all arrive safely at our destination. May there be no traffic jams. Now, these are the four great efforts. By doing this, we're really propelling ourselves down the spiritual path. We'll revisit these efforts again, but pay attention to what's going on in your mind and make the effort to abandon the unwholesome and encourage the wholesome. The seventh on the Eightfold Path is right mindfulness. And what is right mindfulness? Well, it's the four establishments of mindfulness, sometimes called the four foundations of mindfulness. The first one is body, physical body. The second one is Vedana. Vedana refers to your initial categorization of a sensory input, pleasant, unpleasant, or neither. We'll talk a lot about Vedana, but yeah, it's something important to pay attention to because we go running after the pleasant and running away from the unpleasant and ignoring that which is neither. The Buddha says, pay attention. This is important. The third of the four establishments of mindfulness is mind states. Are you happy, sad, confused, upset, angry? What's going on? By knowing your state of mind, it makes it much easier to determine whether you're in a wholesome mind state or an unwholesome mind state. And if you determine that, then you can apply the four great efforts to take care of it. So just simply knowing your state of mind. And then the fourth one is mindfulness of dharmas. The word dharma has uh, different meanings depending on the context. In this context, it would be phenomena. So mindfulness of phenomena. And in particular, mindfulness of phenomena with respect to the Buddhist teachings. And we'll go into the four establishments of mindfulness in great detail as we go through the retreat. There's a lot of good practices based on these. And then the eighth on the Eightfold Path is right concentration, Sama Samadhi. Samadhi, as I said last night, usually is translated as concentration, but perhaps more appropriate would be indistractability. So sama samadhi, appropriate indistractability. And what is appropriate indistractability? Secluded from sense desires, secluded from unwholesome states, one enters and remains in the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. This is right concentration. When the Buddha got to the end of the Dhamma Chakra Pravadana Sutta, he took a look at the five guys and he saw that one of them, Kandanya, got it. He knew. And the Buddha got kind of excited. He says, you know, Kandanya, don't you? You know, which in Pali is something like Anya Kandanya. And indeed, Kandanya did know. He knew that all that arises also ceases. And he attained the first level of awakening called stream entry. We owe a great debt of gratitude to Kandanya. Can you imagine the Buddha gets to the end of his discourse and he looks at the five guys and they go, so <laughs> nobody's got a little dust in their eyes. He gone back to the Bodhi tree and sat there enjoying the bliss of enlightenment for 45 years. But no, Kandanya got it. He knew he could teach this. And one by one over the next several weeks, each of the other guys got to the first stage of awakening. And when he knew their minds were well prepared, he taught them what we usually refer to as the second discourse, the discourse on not self. And at the end of that discourse, all five of them became fully awakened. But we have to save that for another time. 